with my life is a miracle. Every child has a story of, of God's love to share. Shalom world, tune into God's love story. Hi, my name is Brother Maximilian Mary. We're here at the Immaculata Mission School 2020. I have here Ralph Martin, and he's going to speak on the Holy Spirit. Well, it's a big topic, Ralph. Uh, what are you going to touch on today? Well, every single Pope for the last 50 years has fervently prayed for a new Pentecost for the Church, knowing that new documents won't do it, but we need actually an action of God's Spirit. So I'm going to speak about what is this new Pentecost and how can it happen in our own lives. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ralph. Look forward to hearing it. Who is the Holy Spirit? Well, we know He's the third person of the Trinity. We know he's the Lord and giver of life. As we say in the Nicene Creed, he's the Lord and giver of life. We know he's sent by the Father and the Son. We know he comes into our hearts and he cries out in our hearts, Father, dear Father. We know he testifies to us and witnesses to us that we really are the adopted sons and daughters of God, that we really have been taken into the family, that we really belong to him. We also know that when we don't know how to pray, the Spirit of God in the depth of our soul is groaning and travailing that God's will be done in our life. And so, you know, somebody said something here today that's really important. He said, some of you may not be feeling it. Lots of times I'm not feeling it. But you know what? That's where faith comes in. That's where worship can be even more valuable when we're adoring God even when we're not feeling it. So we're not here mainly to get feelings. God is merciful and he knows we're whole persons and he knows that so encouraging us when we feel love. But it's not about the feelings. There's a reality here, there's a substance here, there's a relationship here that's there whether we feel it or not. And all the saints that write about the spiritual life saying, Prayer that's done when we're not feeling it is even more valuable than prayer done when we're feeling it. So thank God when we're feeling it, it feels good, doesn't it? But when you're not feeling it, it's okay. And it might be even more valuable, your, your sacrifice. It talks about a sacrifice of praise. Sometimes it's a sacrifice to praise God. Okay, what else does the Spirit do? He's the source of all the spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, Galatians chapter 5. He's the comforter, he's the advocate, he's the counselor. He gives witness to Christ, glorifying him. John 14, John 15, John 16. He convicts people of sin, of righteousness and judgment. He helps people be born again. He's the giver of life who brings about a new creation. And actually, scripture says, nobody can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now you can, anybody in the world, any unbeliever, any atheist could say Jesus is Lord, they could say the words. But to say the words with love, with faith, with understanding requires an act of God in our soul. You know, it's like when Jesus said to Peter, you know, who do you think I am? Who are people saying I am? Who do you say I am? You're the son of God. And then, Jesus said to Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. So it takes an act of God, a work of the Father, a work of the Holy Spirit to really enable us to believe and to hope and to love and say from our souls, Jesus is Lord. Uh, there's so many other scripture passages, but I just want to tell you that 
the scripture is full of descriptions about the Holy Spirit. And when you're reading the word of God, be alert to how much the Holy Spirit is spoken about and how important the Holy Spirit is. What I really want to talk about today is what is this new Pentecost that every single pope for the last 50 years has been praying for? When St. John the 23rd convened the Second Vatican Council, he asked every, every Catholic in the world to pray that the Lord would renew your wonders in our day as by a new Pentecost. So St. John the 23rd wasn't just hoping for a new set of documents. He got 16 documents and, and some of them are just absolutely fabulous. Just so biblical, so scriptural, so spiritual, so pastoral, and really, really important. And at the very end of the first session, this is what he prayed. He said, the council is a new and dearly desired Pentecost, which will enrich the church abundantly with spiritual energies. So John, St. John the 23rd was, was looking not just for documents, not just for words, but for spiritual power, spiritual energy that would enable us to engage our mission. When St. Paul VI, I think it's pretty significant that every one of these popes that led Vatican Council II has been canonized, every single one of them. St. Paul VI said, more than once we have asked ourselves what the greatest needs of the church are. What is the primary and ultimate need of our beloved and holy church? We must say it with holy fear, because as you know, this concerns the mystery of the church, her life. This need is the spirit. The church needs her eternal Pentecost. She needs fire in her heart, words on her lips, a glance that is prophetic. One of the things that's most missing in the church today is the prophetic dimension. And by the prophetic dimension, I don't mean foretelling the future. I mean speaking God's word with power, with anointing, with boldness, with courage, with clarity, with authority. The primary way in which people experienced Jesus during his earthly ministry was as a prophet. Whenever he says, who, 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 do who do people say I am? Some say Jeremiah, some say Elijah, some say you're the prophet that Moses prophesied. Jesus himself identified himself as a prophet. Remember when he didn't do many miracles in his own town, he said, a prophet is not welcome amongst his own people. He identified himself as prophet. What are prophets known for? Zeal. Zeal for the holiness of God. Zeal for the holiness of God's purpose. Zeal for the purpose of God. St. Thomas Aquinas defines the virtue of zeal as the intensity of love that overcomes every obstacle. So we need the prophetic virtues. We need the prophetic virtue of zeal. Every single baptized Christian is conformed to Jesus Christ as prophet, priest, and king. And the priesthood of all believers isn't a Protestant invention. It's revealed by God. You are a holy priesthood. When priests are ordained, the main focus is on conformity to Christ as priest, offering sacrifice, and also a leader of the people, pastor. And sometimes the prophetic conformity to Christ is interpreted as learning how to give short sermons that don't upset people. That is not the prophetic charism. That is not what it means to be conformed to Christ as prophet. To be conformed to Christ as prophet means to be freed of fear of human opinion and to please God rather than people. That's what Jesus did and that's what got Jesus into trouble. And we will get into trouble, but it's a godly trouble. It's a godly trouble. John Paul II. He says, today we must courageously face a situation which is becoming increasing, increasingly diversified and demanding in the context of globalization and the new and uncertain mingling of peoples and cultures. He says, over the years, I have often repeated the summons to the new evangelization. I do so again now 
but especially in order to insist that we must rekindle in ourselves the impetus of the beginnings and allow ourselves to be filled with the ardor of the apostolic preaching which followed Pentecost. We must revive in ourselves the burning conviction of Paul who cried out, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. This is from Novo Millennio Eniunte that was just mentioned the other night. Uh, Pope John Paul II's vision for the Catholic Church for the new millennium, really inspiring, really powerful. He said, there's three things. He says, I'm gonna look back on the last 40 or 50 years from Vatican II up to the beginning of the new millennium and I'm gonna ask what has the Holy Spirit primarily been speaking to us for, during this whole time with all the documents, all the synods, everything that's been going on. He picked out three things. He said the Holy Spirit has helped us rediscover the universal call to holiness. That every single baptized person is honestly called to put your picture here, right here. And this is really powerful, and really important. We'll be devoting a good number of talks to that next week. The second thing he said, the Holy Spirit has led us to rediscover the church, not just as an institution or organization, but as a communion of love. The Trinity, God, is a communion of love. He's not an organization. He's not a structure. He's a communion of interpersonal love, and the church on earth is supposed to be beginning to bring us into that communion of interpersonal love. And that's why our relationship with one another as brothers and sisters of Christ is so important. We can't be lone Christians. We need friendship in Christ. We need to travel together with brothers and sisters. You know, after I made that, that retreat when I was a senior at the university, Oh, one of the things that the retreat movement recommended is that we get into a small group. So I have been in a small men's group for more than 50 years. People have, have kind of changed and moved, but it's just always been there. We really need to be accountable to each other. We need to be able to support each other. We need to be able to talk about the struggles we're having. So we need friendship in Christ. We really, really do especially in the culture today. It's so easy if we're alone to be deceived, to be discouraged, to be picked off by the evil one, to let those darts of the enemy get into our soul. So then he goes on to say, this passion will not fail to start in the church a new sense of mission, which cannot be left to a group of specialists, but must involve the responsibility of all the members of the people of God. Those who have come into a genuine contact with Christ cannot keep him for themselves. Unfortunately, Catholics are famous all over the world for keeping Christ to themselves. You know, a lot of people say, hey, hey, Baptists and Pentecostals talk about Jesus. We do the works of mercy. Let's leave it like that. We like this great division in the body of Christ. You know, we, we, we're, we're quiet about our relationship, but we do the works of mercy. No, it's all supposed to be together. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the new evangelization and the role of lay people. The missionary mandate accompanies us into the third millennium and urges us to share the enthusiasm of the very first Christians. And we can count on the power of the same spirit who was poured out at Pentecost and who impels us still today to start out anew, sustained by the hope which does not disappoint. Notice the language here. I insist that we must rekindle in ourselves the impetus of the beginnings. What's the impetus of the beginnings? The impetus of the beginnings is Pentecost. The impetus of the beginnings is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The impetus of the beginnings is fire from on high. The impetus of the beginning is wind and fire that impels the disciples to be witnesses for Jesus. Then he says, we must revive in ourselves the burning conviction of Paul who cried out, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. We need a burning conviction. We need not just kind of correct doctrine, as important that is. I've been fighting for all my adult life for correct doctrine, but correct doctrine is supposed to lead to a deep relationship and a burning conviction that's ignited in our heart. Notice the language. This passion will not fail to stir in the church a new sense of mission. One of the things that's most missing in many of our Catholic gatherings, institutions, organizations, is passion, is fire, is enthusiasm. 
That's exactly what John Paul is saying. I saying we need today. We really can't have a new evangelization unless we have a new Pentecost. We need power from on high. We need not just good ideas and good structures and synods and assemblies and diocese and this and that. We need power from on high. Pope Benedict XVI. Christ's entire mission is summed up in this, to baptize us in the Holy Spirit and to plunge us into the vastness of being in which we are simply overwhelmed with joy. And listen to what he said in World Youth Day in Australia in 2008. Yay, World Youth Day Australia, 2008, okay. This is what he said. He said, together we shall invoke the Holy Spirit, confidently asking God for the gift of a new Pentecost for the church and for humanity in the third millennium. Every single pope since Vatican II has been praying for God to send us a new Pentecost. When, when Pope Benedict came to the United States, he was in St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City, and he said, let us implore from God the grace of a new Pentecost for the church in America. May tongues of fire combining burning love of God and neighbor with zeal for the spread of Christ's kingdom descend on all present. Hey, let's have that descend on us all present, okay? Do we want the Holy Spirit to descend on us? Yes, we do. A couple of years ago, I was asked to give a couple of talks to the Catholic Charismatic Renewal in Italy, and there were 52,000 of them in the Olympic Stadium in Rome. And, and they had asked Pope Francis to please send the message of greeting. He said, I don't want to send the message of greeting. I want to come. But I only want to come if you sing my favorite song. And, and it's in Spanish, and I can't sing, and it's Jesus is alive, Jesus is alive, he lives, he lives, he lives. So he comes into the stadium in his little tiny Ford Focus, which I thought was kind of cool, you know, rather than the usual Mercedes, you know, so just a lot of really positive things there. And uh, he comes up to the stage, and uh, we start singing his favorite song, you know, especially those who can sing and those who know Spanish. And, uh, and, and, and then he kind of shares a little bit. He says... Uh, when I first met the Catholic Charismatics in Argentina, I really thought they were crazy. He said, it seemed like they were running a school for samba. You know? <laughs> he says, and then, then I talked to people and their lives had changed. They, they, they turned away from sin. They, they were loving the Lord. They were sharing their faith. And I said, there's really something here. And he said, I think that this baptism in the spirit is important for the entire church and I want you to share this grace with the entire church. Now, I'm not here to promote a particular movement. I benefit a lot from the Curcio movement. I benefit a lot, benefit a lot from the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. I benefit, a, I benefit a lot from the Spanish mystics. I benefit a lot from the teachings of the popes and the documents of Vatican II. I, I, I've tried to receive all the riches that the church has and not be identified with one against the other, but I want all the Lord has. I want every aspect of what he's revealing that's available to us. So Cardinal Soons, whom I mentioned the other night, used to say that the purpose of the Catholic charismatic renewal in the church is not to get everybody into it, but to be a witness in the church to what belongs to the entire church. Because obviously, the Holy Spirit doesn't belong to a particular movement. The movement belongs to the Holy Spirit. Obviously, the gifts of the Holy Spirit don't belong to a particular movement. They belong to the church. You know, in, in the Constitution of the Church, section 12, it says, God doesn't just work through the ordained ministers and, and sacraments of the church, but he also works through every single baptized person who the Holy Spirit distributes gifts to. And it quotes 1 Corinthians chapter 12, right there in the council document. So Cardinal Sunans would say, the purpose of this particular movement is not to get everybody into it, but to wake people up to everything that we really have available to us as Catholics. I just want to be a Catholic. I don't want to be a tratty or progressive or charismatic or whatever. I want to be a Catholic. So anyway, there we have it about that. Now, 
Let's take a look at the first Pentecost to see if we can learn some lessons from the first Pentecost that would make it possible to welcome a new Pentecost in our own lives and in the lives of the church. Because so when we talk about a new Pentecost, I think it'd be pretty relevant to look at the first Pentecost to see what the new Pentecost might actually look like. It's really powerful what you discover when you look at what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and how the scripture talks about it. In each of the four gospels, John the Baptist introduces Jesus not only as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, but as the one who will baptize in the Holy Spirit and fire. For example, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3. What comes before this is really interesting. John the Baptist isn't winning friends and influencing people by being nice. Many Pharisees and Sadducees are coming out to be baptized because they want to please the people. John the Baptist sees their motivations and he says to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce good fruit as evidence of your repentance and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now, the ax lies at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I am baptizing you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. Sometimes I'm not, I feel like I'm not worthy to be even alive on the face of the earth because of the holiness of God. Not to mention to be at mass. I mean, to be in presence of the holiness of God, to even exist in the universe with such a holy God. Only by his mercy dare we say his name. Only by his mercy dare we approach the Holy Eucharist. Only because we're commanded to eat his body and drink his blood, dare we eat his body and drink his blood. I am baptizing you with water for repentance, but the one who's coming after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Jesus says, I'm longing for fire to fall on the earth. The fire of the Holy Spirit that will cleanse, that will purify, but also will judge. I'm longing for evil to be removed from the universe. I'm longing for my children to be purified. So it is a scary thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is. When you fall into holiness, you either become holy or you separate yourself forever from God. So yes, this is not a game this week. Christianity is not a game. This is not an optional enrichment exercise. This is not just something we do for those who are spiritually inclined or had nothing better to do. This is meeting God. And how we respond is really important. Jesus himself spoke about how important it was to be clothed with power from on high. Luke chapter 24, just before he ascends to the Father, he does a general review with the apostles about stuff he taught them. He said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written, that the Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Now, those of you who are engaged in some mission work, those of you who are priests or seminarians, those of you who are studying with theology degrees, those of you who share the gospel in any way, Jesus here is telling us what we're supposed to do. He said you're supposed to preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus to all the nations. One of the things you hardly hear at all in the church today is repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
We think caring for the environment is the mission of the church. It's not. It's a side issue. The central issue is the forgiveness of sins. The reason why the environment is messed up is because of sin. You can't create the kingdom of God on earth without the king. And all the efforts to create the kingdom of God on earth without the king are doomed to horrible failure, totalitarian oppression, the means justifying, the end justifying the means, oppressing people to remove people who are blocking the kingdom without the king. And then Jesus said, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. What is this mysterious being clothed with power from on high? Orthodoxy is not enough. Liturgical correctness is not enough. There's something else that's needed to be clothed with power from on high, the very breath of God coming into our soul, the very spirit of God moving us as the spirit moved Jesus into love of the Father and mission. The apostles stayed in the city. They were highly motivated actually not to get out of the locked room. And they did the first novena. Mary and 120 for nine days prayed to be clothed with power from on high. Another scene, another scene of the ascension, Jesus is in the Acts, Acts chapter one. He presented himself alive to them by many proofs after he had suffered, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, when the apostles rush out of the upper room after Pentecost, how did they know what to say? Jesus told them. Jesus explained the scriptures to them. Jesus explained who he was. Jesus explained how the Psalms and Moses and the prophets all spoke of him. The apostles got their message from Jesus. Did Jesus know what he was talking about? He sure did. Everything's been created through him and for him. The scriptures have come to existence through him and for him. And they, they point to him. While meeting with them, he urged them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father about which you have heard me speak, Luke chapter 24. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be baptized? It means to be immersed. It means to be overwhelmed. It means to be drowned. It means to be just immersed in the Holy Spirit. Now, Scripture scholars say that the phrase baptism in the Holy Spirit that Jesus and the apostles use should be understood as referring to the fullness of Christian initiation. What became focus in baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist, Christian initiation in the early church, is what baptism in the Spirit is all about. Now, when you read accounts of the early Christian initiation processes, they expected people to experience an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and a manifestation of charismatic gifts. There's lengthy studies on this. It's, it's incontrovertible that there was an experiential element to the sacraments of Christian initiation that they were expecting. When they had gathered together, they asked them, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They still don't get it. They're still saying, when are you going to kick out the Romans, Lord? Come on, when are we going to kind of triumph and kind of sit at your right hand and right, left hand and kind of rule in Jerusalem? They still don't get it. He answered them, It's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has established by his own authority, but you will receive power. There's something called power. There's something called presence. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem throughout Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Then he left them. Okay, they had their novena. On the ninth day, something happened. They were clothed with power from on high. The Holy Spirit overshadowed them. Now, John Paul II has a really interesting meditation about the role of Mary in the upper room. 
He said Mary had already had been filled with the Holy Spirit more than any human being ever had been. She was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit and became the mother of Jesus. But he went on to say that Mary wasn't in the upper room just praying for the apostles, but she was praying, believe it or not, for more of the Holy Spirit for her, to her for her new role now, not just as the mother of Jesus, but as mother of the church. She needed a new anointing of the Holy Spirit, a new being clothed with the Holy Spirit for the new dimension of her mission, mother of the church. St. Thomas Aquinas says, there can be many sendings of the Holy Spirit, many overshadowings of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when your life's taking a different turn or there's a new mission beginning or you're entering in a new phase of your life, there's new sendings of the Holy Spirit. So I would suggest that for the rest of the today, you, you ask God to send you the Holy Spirit in, in greater measure, in greater abundance. Okay, so the Holy Spirit falls on them, they rush out, and they start speaking in tongues and all that kind of stuff. And people say, what the heck's going on? And the Holy Spirit has a sense of humor. So he, he, he put in here one of the explanations. They must be drunk. Now, that has a meaning and a purpose. They were acting like drunk people. You know, in the book of Ephesians, Paul says, don't get drunk in the Holy Spirit, but be intoxicated. Don't get drunk with wine, but get intoxicated by the Holy Spirit. And Father Canto La Mesa, the uh, Capuchin preacher to the papal household for all these popes, taught, wrote a book called The Sober Intoxication of the Holy Spirit. That there's an actual joy, there's an actual jubilation. We'll, we'll read about that when Teresa of Avila talks about joy and jubilation breaking out in her convent and lasting for days. So joy and jubilation is one of the signs of the Holy Spirit. So Peter gets up and says, no, we're not drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. Too early to be drinking. But he says, what you see and hear is what is the fulfillment of everything God's been doing to prepare the Jewish people. As Archbishop Julian said, this Jesus whom you crucified has been raised from the dead. Now he's at the right hand of the Father, pouring out what you see and hear. There's a certain visibility to being clothed with power from on high. There is. There's a certain visibility to it. A certain sense of presence, a certain sense of joy, a certain sense of love. Uh, the, uh, we'll, we'll get into that more later, but there's a certain sense to it, a certain way you can sense the Holy Spirit. So then they said, it says they were cut to the heart. Why were they cut to the heart? Because Peter's words were spoken with authority in the power of the Holy Spirit. We've been given authority, every single one of us. We've been given authority to resist the devil. Scripture says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. When you're being tempted and you think there's an evil spirit plaguing you, resist him in the name of Jesus and he'll go. Speak the word of God with authority under the power of the Holy Spirit as he indicates. And then Peter says, what you should do is repent, every one of you, be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. And then he adds, and this, and you will receive the Holy Spirit because this gift is for you, it's for your children, and it's for everybody that God is drawing to himself. This is the most authoritative interpretation of Pentecost and the meaning of Pentecost. This gift of the Holy Spirit's for you, it's for your children, and it's for everybody that God is drawing to himself. Now, at different times in the history of the church, mini history lesson again, when it didn't seem like the Holy Spirit was very visible and doing very much, maybe faith had diminished or various other things happened, theologians began to speculate about why the Holy Spirit, we are not seeing the Holy Spirit do the same things we read about in the scripture. And sometimes they said, well, the Holy Spirit was needed to get the church started, but now that it started, we have the magisterium, we don't need the Holy Spirit. Now that's totally crazy. I was just having a conversation with a bishop. You can probably guess who it is. The bishops are under siege today. They're at their wit's end. The problems they're dealing with are so difficult and so stressful. They know that they need more than their 
human wisdom. They know they need more than procedures and processes. They know they need God. Another reason that theologians sometimes said that the Holy Spirit isn't being experienced so widely is because it's just for leaders and great saints. That's not what Scripture says. That's not what Scripture says. Peter says, this is for you, it's for your children, it's for everybody that God's drawing to himself. It's the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. Young men, old men, young women, old women, uh, male, female, it's for everybody. This is really important. It's not just for a few special people, it's for everybody. Now, every time in the next 20 or 30 years after Pentecost, as the gospel was preached to new groups of people, the apostles were explicitly concerned that they come into the same experience of the Holy Spirit that they did on the day of Pentecost. This is important. Acts chapter 8. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For it had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, we can't be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and not receive the Holy Spirit, but it, there wasn't a strong enough experience. So something didn't happen that the apostles knew was supposed to happen, so they sent the apostles down to pray with them, saying, come on, Holy Spirit, we know you want to do more for these people. They laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon the magician saw that the Spirit was conferred by the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, how much would it cost for me to be able to do this? Give me this power too, so that anyone upon whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. That's where the word simony comes from, trying to bait by money for sacred things. Acts chapter 10. Peter has a vision. Unclean animals being lowered in a sheet. And a voice says, slaughter these, Peter, and eat them. And Peter says, I can't do that, Lord. I'm a good Jew. And the Lord said, I'm going to expand your understanding about what it means to be a good Jew. I want you to go to a Gentile's house. I want you to go to Cornelius' house and tell them about me and watch what happens. Acts chapter 10, while Peter was in Cornelius' house speaking about Jesus the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the word. The Jewish believers who had accompanied Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit should have been poured out on the Gentiles, for they could hear them speaking in tongues and glorifying God. How did they know that the Holy Spirit was poured out? There was a certain visibility to it. There was a certain effect to it. Something changed. There was a, a release of the power of prayer in them. Okay, many, many, many lesson on speaking in tongues. I know it's strange to hear about that. There's three different kinds of speaking in tongues talked about in the New Testament. The first kind is what happened on the day of Pentecost, where people, the apostles were proclaiming, and people understood what was being said in their own words. That happens occasionally. I know people, and I've experienced it myself, where I've heard somebody speaking a language. I said, oh, when did you learn medieval French? They said, I don't know medieval French. It happens. It's rare. Second kind of speaking in tongues is where it talks about the ministry of giving a message in tongues and interpreting it, where somebody in a prayer gathering, they feel moved to speak out something in a language they don't understand, and then somebody else, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gets an understanding of what's being said and says it in the language that can be understood. Happens occasionally. The third kind of speaking in tongues is the most common, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where Paul says, I speak in tongues more than any of you, and I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more that you prophesy. There's a person who speaks in tongues and speaking mysteries unto God. What it is is releasing different dimensions of our soul and our being to express things to God deeper than the words that we can know by our native language. It's not an essential gift, it's a helpful gift. In many ways it's helpful because it opens the door to other gifts. The humility that it takes to speak in tongues, the surrender that it takes to speak in tongues, often is a doorway that leads to a greater surrender to the Lord and a greater experience of his other gifts. Okay. Then Peter responded, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit even as we have? So he says, look, the same thing just happened to them that happened to us. 
How can I not baptize them? Well, Peter gets in trouble back at headquarters. You did what, Peter? You baptized Gentiles? What the heck? So now Peter has to defend himself. As I began to speak, Acts chapter 11, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the words of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now in John's gospel, when Jesus is describing all the things the Holy Spirit's gonna do, he says the Holy Spirit will remind you of things that I've said. Here we have the Holy Spirit reminding Peter about what, John, what, what Jesus had talked to them about being baptized in the Holy Spirit so that Peter could apply the proper understanding to what he had just happened. Then Peter says, if God gave them the same gift he gave to us when we came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to be able to hinder God? When they heard this, they stopped objecting and glorified God saying, God has then granted life-giving repentance to the Gentiles too. Who would have thought? There's a couple things here we need to notice. Hear what Peter said, if God gave them the same gift he gave to us when we came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, did the apostles first come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ at Pentecost? Yes and no. They believed before, but very uncertainly very unclearly, not really getting Jesus and not really getting the whole purpose of God. So they believed kind of, not with the conviction, not with the clarity, not with the certainty that would have ever enabled them to die for Jesus. After Pentecost, they had that clarity. They had that certainty. They had that experience. They had that conviction. So there's a way in which they came into the fullness of faith only after Pentecost. And there's a lot of Catholics, a lot of our fellow Catholics who believe in the Lord, but not with the depth of conviction, not with the passion, not with the certainty that would ever enable them to endure persecution. And we're going to have to face persecution, so we really need the power of the Holy Spirit. Last text, Acts chapter 19. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior of the country and came down to Ephesus where he found some disciples. And he asked them, a funny question. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? Now, why would Paul ask a group of believers that question? He sensed something missing. He felt something wasn't there. What wasn't there? Was it joy? Was it brotherly love? Was it the ability to pray and praise? What was it? We don't know, but he sensed something was missing. So then he asked them some other questions. They answered him, we've never even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, how were you baptized? They replied with the baptism of John. So now Paul understands where they're coming from. This is a good method of evangelization, isn't it? Ask somebody where they're coming from. Ask them where they're at in relationship with God. Ask them you know, where they're at in, in, in their faith. And, and then understand where they're at, and then you'll be able to know kind of where to go to help them take the next step. That's what Paul did. She says, okay, now I know what to say. John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who is to come after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. They spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were 12 of them. Acts 4, the leaders of the people tell them, shut up or we're going to kill you. Stop talking about Jesus or we're going to kill you. What do they do? They say, Lord, we need more of your Holy Spirit. We need your signs and wonders. We're going to go and preach. You need to do signs and wonders to back up what we're doing. Last text, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. For this reason, I remind you to stir into flame the gift of God that you have through the imposition of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather of power and love and self-control. Probably talking about ordination, the gift of priesthood. Paul's telling Timothy, hey, you got something when I laid hands on you in the sacrament of ordination. Stir it up. It's died down. Stir it up. All of us who have received baptism, confirmation, it's there. Stir it up. Stir it up. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to stir it up. 
Hi, I'm here with Adele, who's come from Tasmania. Adele, why are mission schools important for you and for other young people? Because it really helps me with my soul and my growth as a young person to really set the world aflame with the love of Christ. And what was your highlight at this mission school? Um, my highlight has been um, really growing in prayer and deepening my faith and knowing more about Jesus Christ who um, gave His life up for us. That's awesome. Thank you, Adele. A lot of talk in our church today about the new evangelization and we might ask well what's new about the new evangelization one thing that's new is that we're trying to renew the faith in people who should already be catholic should already be christian individuals families communities whole cultures that need to rediscover the gospel and so what's new is that they're getting a new shot in the arm of faith of evangelization another thing that's new about it is the way that we do that and the new media and groups like Shalom World TV are very important for bringing the gospel anew to our cultures, to our families, to each of us individually. And so I encourage all the viewers of Shalom World TV and I encourage uh, Shalom World TV themselves to keep up the good work, uh, to keep watching this channel and to keep up the good work of presenting the Catholic faith to our world today.